In 1973, two scientists in California carried out a remarkable experiment. The driver of this car had told no one where he was going. At the same time, five miles away, shielded from all known means of communication, Physicist and psychic researcher Russell Targ sat with a man who said he could describe where the car had gone. Science has no explanation for what happened next. These are the first words the man spoke. I'm seeing a boat dock, boat jetty. That's definitely lots of little boats. Uh, Motor launch, uh, sailboats. Definitely, definitely a uh, boat dock or a jetty. For the past 10 years, we've been investigating a phenomenon called remote viewing. Uh, we found that many individuals are able to accurately describe what's going on in distant locations, blocked from any kind of ordinary perception. As a physicist, I would have to say one of the findings is that the mind is no longer limited by the parameters of the body. But was it a hoax or an innocent case of self-deception? Well, I used to think that the Targan put-off experiments might have been uh, a genuine phenomenon. But uh, after looking at their data and doing my own experiments, I've concluded that it's one big illusion. Early laboratory tests of extrasensory powers did suffer from inadequate controls. And a lady, a goddess, came walking over the ocean, and she, in her right hand, she let loose a butterfly. But in response to criticism, experimenters have improved their methods. I believe anyone who dispassionately looks at the experimental work in this field will come away from a feeling that there is certainly something here that deserves further investigation. The majority of the scientific community doesn't believe in the existence of psychic phenomena, and I'm afraid that demonstrates that the majority of the scientific community is simply ignorant. Okay, right, I'm just gonna put the headphones on you. But ignorance is no explanation for researchers who have tried to find ESP and failed. The other possibility, of course, is that there's no ESP anyway and uh, I just don't get results because it's not there. So is all this research effort a monumental waste of time? Or is science developing a new understanding of our world, one which may vastly extend human powers? What is the real evidence for ESP? For the Victorians, mind reading was a parlor game. They called it telepathy. But in 1882, a group of distinguished British academics tried to make it respectable and founded a society to investigate the paranormal scientifically. Although their main interest was in contacting the dead, their first research project concerned the living. Then, as now, many ordinary people reported strange telepathic experiences and premonitions of the deaths of distant loved ones, especially when the death was unexpected or violent. They collected over 700 cases, but most other scientists were skeptical. They said the evidence was only anecdotal and the cases could be explained as mere coincidence. Only 50 years ago, at Duke University, researchers began developing better methods for gathering evidence of ESP. The earliest laboratory work on psychic phenomena was done here at the Institute for Parapsychology. 
The Institute, which is now an independent research center, was established by a former botanist, Joseph Banks Rhine. In his studies, Rhine used these five distinctive cards. With cards, he could use statistics to assess the results of his experiments. In this unique archive film of a typical test, the subject had to guess the order of a pack of 25 cards dealt face down by the experimenter. She pointed to each symbol to indicate her guess. When the experiment was over, the experimenter counted up the number of correct guesses. Find out what your score was. You got one circle. To find out if she was psychic, Ryan used the standard laws of chance. Two waves. The pack of 25 cards contained five lots of five separate symbols. Statistically, over a long series of tests, she should have guessed five cards right by chance. Nine, ten, eleven. That's marvelous. Six, one. But one experiment proved nothing. Ryan did thousands of trials on hundreds of people. This one tested the power of mind over matter to affect the fall of dice. Five, one. Two, one. Prolonged testing was essential because for statistical proof, they needed consistent scores well above chance. Another experiment examined foretelling the future. The subject had to list the five symbols in the order in which she thought the experimenter would list them after the test. A table of random numbers determined the order in which he put his list. So this is a very good score. You would expect a score of five by chance, but you have a score of 11. So that's really very fine. Ryan identified four psychic abilities. Telepathy, mind-to-mind -mind communication. Clairvoyance, seeing things at a distance. Precognition, knowing the future. These he called extrasensory perception. On its own, psychokinesis, moving things at a distance. To describe all four abilities, Ryan coined the term psi. He said there was firm proof for three of them. We can say that uh, clairvoyance, the precognition, and PK, a moving target, are in a, this very firm category. It begins to look as though it's, uh, the capacity, psi capacity in general, including ESP and PK, is a natural property, natural capacity Mark Hansel is Emeritus Professor of Psychology at Swansea University in Wales. He's a renowned critic of research in parapsychology. He says Ryan's experiments were poorly conducted, his evidence was feeble, and conflicted with common sense. There are plenty of cases of everyday activities which, if telepathy were possible, or precognition, or psychokinesis, the, that uh, this would become quite manifest. If anybody was telepathic, they should be able to quite easily demonstrate the effect to anybody. I'd be completely satisfied by just talking to the person for a few minutes and asking to say what I was thinking of. You know, difficulty. Uh, with the experiments, there'd be no difficulty if, uh, if one could confirm the result. But the plain fact is that they don't confirm. The results are entirely what one would predict from a normal knowledge of the way people behave in experiments and the way people of the past history of the subject, for example, which shows that there's a very, very high incidence of both experimental error and straight outright trickery in parapsychology. Fraud has occurred in parapsychology. British researcher Dr. S.G. Soule altered experimental records to improve his subject's telepathic scores. Walter Levy, Ryan's protege, admitted to tampering with the machinery recording his tests of ESP in animals. When Ryan found out, he urged all parapsychologists to tighten experimental controls and have their work replicated by others. But Ryan faced another problem. Many of his subject scores declined as testing continued. In the 1950s, at the City College of New York, Professor Gertrude Schmeidler, an experimental psychologist, developed a test which improved on Ryan's results. Using a random number table, she drew up a list of 25 ESP symbols. Then Schmeidler locked the list away to prevent any cheating or fraud.
Over 1,300 people took part in the experiment to test Schmeidler's theory that some people are better at ESP than others. Before the test, the subjects were asked if they believed in ESP or not. Then they guessed the order of the five symbols in the list of 25. As in Rhine's experiments, the laws of chance say they'd expect to get five right just by accident. After over 10,000 trials, the scores of the believers and non-believers were added up separately. On average, the believers got just over five right and the skeptical non-believers just under. Although small, the difference was statistically extremely significant. Schmeidler named it the sheep-goat effect. In 30 similar experiments, other scientists also found a pretty consistent sheep-goat difference. The results suggested that ESP could be studied scientifically. So what's the evidence for the first ESP faculty? Telepathy. Parapsychologists knew that people often reported psychic experiences in their dreams. So in the early 60s at the Maimonides Medical Center in New York, controlled experiments were done in dream telepathy. A picture would be looked at by a sender who tried to transmit it to someone in another room. During the night, the sleeper was awakened and asked what she was dreaming of. This is a recreation of a typical nightly trial. And a lady, a goddess, came walking over the ocean and she, in her right hand, she let loose a butterfly, a green and pink butterfly. The laboratory reported significant results in nine of 13 studies which led Charles Honerton to design an even better experiment. Dreaming, hypnosis, meditation, and similar states do share certain common characteristics, the most important of which seem to be that they are all associated with functional sensory deprivation. So we developed a technique that involves a mild sensory deprivation or perceptual isolation procedure called Gansfeld. Red globes over the eyes, white noise in the ears, Parapsychologists hoped the Gunsfeld sensory deprivation technique would reduce distractions and improve psychic functioning. Again, the subject tried to pick up any telepathic transmission from the sender in another room. The sender was looking at Viewmaster slides of Las Vegas. This experiment was filmed as it happened. This is what the subject said kind of a landscape. It's the name of a nightclub. Marquis, nightclub marquees, just seeing them. Uh, nightclub marquees in Las Vegas. It seemed a direct hit. But for later statistical analysis, the experimental protocol required the subject to examine four groups of slides and choose the one which was closest to what she'd seen. There are a lot of things here that seem to correspond with the imagery that I was getting. It is. Yeah, it's Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Yeah. To date, nearly 1,800 Gunsfeld sessions have been conducted in 15 different laboratories. Almost half reported significant results. But not everyone has been successful. Seven laboratories found absolutely nothing. Someone who has consistently failed to find any ESP is Susan Blackmore, once an enthusiastic psychic researcher. Parapsychologists admit many experimenters fail to get positive results, but blame it on what they call an experimenter effect. Somehow, the experimenter interferes with the psychic process. For Blackmore, that explanation is just too convenient. Some people say it's because I didn't have the right attitude towards the experiments, I didn't believe strongly enough that it's a kind of experimenter effect, that if the experimenter doesn't have the right attitude, he'll fail. There are any number of problems with that, because in the beginning, I was a believer. Now, obviously, I can't convince you or anybody else that I believed 10 years ago. I can only say that I know it myself, and I know people who knew me then who say so. And yet I still didn't get results at that stage, and I certainly don't get them now. The other possibility, of course, is that there's no ESP anyway, and uh, that I just don't get results because it's not there. 
With an elusive phenomenon like telepathy, one researcher's failure need not discredit the entire enterprise. However, most scientists would argue that the researchers reporting success need to take more care in designing their experiments. Professor of psychology Ray Hyman has reviewed all the published Gonsfeld experiments. He criticizes the way many of them were done. There were sensory leakers, the possibility that the same targets that were actually handled, the target that was actually handled by the subject was actually given to the recipient to judge. There could be a possibility of various kinds of sensory clues that way. I found that 52% of their experiments used inadequate methods of randomization, like hand shuffling of slides and things that we know better now today. That might have been okay in the days of 30s when Ryan was doing experiments with cars, but not today. For example, if the sender's picture had been selected by hand, like this, Hyman said the experiment was invalid. It should have been chosen by computer. Hyman also discounted an experiment if the actual picture transmitted by the sender was later given to the subject to judge. Fingerprints or deliberate marks could have given a clue to the correct picture. A copy should have been used. Right, that's it. Well, we can go and find out what the target was now. Until okay. such experimental flaws are eliminated, Hyman believes the claims for telepathy remain unproven. One, two, Professor Hansel has another criticism. If they want to regard the subject as scientifically as it were demonstrated or proved, they have to accept the normal criteria which scientists adopt. And uh, one, if one has to demonstrate the existence of some very unlikely phenomenon, one needs a demonstration of that phenomenon, which will almost invariably give the same result. It's generally accepted that a scientific finding to be valid must be repeatable. However, some psychologists disagree and say parapsychology is every bit as good as conventional psychology. The evidence for psi is comparable to the evidence for a variety of other phenomena in psychology. Uh, there's uh, no great difference in the quality of the, the best researchers working in the field the quality of the research they do, uh, nor the uh, nature of the evidence. It is true that the phenomena cannot be demonstrated on demand in the way in which in an elementary physics laboratory you can count on everybody's demonstrating exactly the same phenomenon. Uh, there's nothing like that in parapsychology. Uh, there's nothing like that in some fields of psychology, too. Uh, but because uh, the phenomena don't seem so intrinsically unbelievable, uh, people don't uh, often uh, put them to the test. The problem is neither psychology nor parapsychology study events which are totally predictable. But a far more fundamental objection to parapsychology is that psychic phenomena conflict with all the known laws of nature. Physics, one of the most advanced and successful sciences in the world, has probed the secrets of the atom in detail. Yet physicists have found nothing that might explain how psychic phenomena occur. Still, the pioneers of quantum physics in the 1920s did recognize that their revolutionary discoveries made the nature of reality a much more open and uncertain question than in the days of Newton. Classical physics described matter as following regular determined laws, but the new physics found that deep within the atom Many things happened by pure chance. A few physicists asked, if matter is so uncertain, could it be affected by the mind and explain psychokinesis? Some people, it said, have the extraordinary power to move objects using just their minds. A few physicists have tried to investigate it. Dr. Helmut Schmidt is a former research physicist with Boeing. He claims that the mind can affect the fundamental particles in matter. This piece of decaying radioactive rock is emitting a stream of atomic particles. Precisely when an atom decays is a matter of chance. To see if people could affect it mentally, Schmidt built this machine. Inside, a radioactive source triggers the lights to go a step one way or the other, completely at random. Physics says there is a time when this atom decays is determined by pure chance. 
And so a good speculation, I think, is that where the physicist says this is pure chance, there the mind has a small place to enter. Schmidt conducted preliminary trials to find subjects who were successful at influencing the machine. Then he did a formal experiment. One with the light, you think nothing else, just work on the light. See that you try to move it around this way. This is a reconstruction. The subject had to try and think the random lights to go clockwise. Are you ready to go? Ready the second ready. subject had to do the same. Go. But though he tried to make the lights go clockwise, they consistently tended to go counterclockwise. It was, nonetheless, inexplicable by the laws of physics. After 50 runs, the data showed the woman had consistently made the lights go clockwise and the man the reverse. The effect was small, just a 2% deviation from chance, but highly significant to any statistician. It looks like a small effect, but it, we did the experiments long enough that we could say it was not chance anymore. They, these people were not lucky. It was a real systematic effect. And 2% may not be a, play a big role in, you ask, what it is good, is it good for? But from the basic viewpoint, there is something which is inconsistent with physics. And we certainly are used to work with small, small effects in physics. But was his machine really random? Schmidt tested it exhaustively and reported that when no one was trying to influence it, the lights moved neither clockwise nor counterclockwise. But Professor Hansel believes it can be explained only too simply, by fraud. It is possible for that the, either the subject or the investigator or some other person could have contrived to produce that result. If I was the subject, I think I could. I, I can't be certain because I haven't had this confirmed by Schmidt, but I think I could, with a little cunning, affect the apparatus so that I'd achieve a high score. Not surprisingly, Schmidt totally rejects Hansel's explanation. He says his machine had elaborate safeguards to detect any malfunction, including tampering. And there were two permanent records of each trial, in the machine and on tape. Even fellow critics question Hansel's suspicions. Hansel has a tendency to believe that if any experiment can be shown to be uh, susceptible to fraud, then that immediately means it no longer can be used as evidence for sign. I do sympathize with the parapsychologists who rebut this by saying, well, that can be true of any experiment in the world because there's always some way you can think of how fraud could have gotten into an experiment. You cannot make a perfectly 100% fraud-proof experiment. This would apply to all science. It seems unlikely that fraud underlies all the research on psychokinesis. Several researchers have replicated Schmidt's results, including Dr. Dean Radin at Bell Labs and Dr. Robert Morris of Syracuse University. Charles Onerton did three replications in the mid-70s. Altogether, 19 scientists have confirmed Schmidt's findings, including aerospace engineer Robert John, dean of the School of Engineering at Princeton University. John's study of psychokinesis on random events inside a solid-state electronic component produced results very similar to Schmidt's. Schmidt now believes his fellow physicists can no longer ignore the evidence. If present physics cannot explain these phenomena, that means that physics isn't complete, and physicists are quite used to drastic changes. They have changed their worldview in the past very often. Helmut Schmidt's not the only physicist to pioneer experiments in psychic phenomena. Others have joined him from the high-powered world of the laser. In 1977, two laser physicists published an account of their research at the Stanford Research Institute in California. Harold Puthoff is a laser patent holder, like his colleague, Russell Targ and they've made an intensive study of the third major psychic faculty, clairvoyance.
the ability to perceive things hidden or at a distance. They called it remote viewing. For the past 10 years, we've been investigating a phenomenon called remote viewing. In this experimental series, which has been carried on now with hundreds of subjects in the laboratory, we found that many individuals are able to accurately describe what's going on in distant locations, blocked from any kind of ordinary perception. Targ and Puthoff began their first formal experiments in 1973 with a psychic, Pat Price. Typically, they were done like this. While Targ remained with Price in the laboratory, Puthoff left with a colleague for a nearby location without telling Targ or Price where he was going. At a prearranged time, Price tried to locate him. The electrically shielded cage guarded against radio contact. The Price experiments are among the most challenging in the whole history of psychic research. So we are reconstructing them in detail, drawing on the records and transcripts of the original experiments. Pat Price was a police commissioner and a firm believer in psychic powers. He felt he used his ESP skills often in daily life. Price died in 1975. What do they seem to be doing at their location? An actor speaks his words. Uh, well, they seem to be high up uh, in a tower. I keep flashing on Koi Tower. Um, I see red, there's red roofs, uh, tile, tile, floor, and roof. Uh, now they're walking through colonnades. Uh, it seems to me this, uh, it's a building, a uh, separate building by itself, a library, a museum of some kind. Um, could this be, uh, Hoover Tower at the Stanford campus? It was. Putoff had gone to the top of the Hoover Tower. Below him were the red roofs and red tiles as described by Price. Price had also correctly identified colonnades and the fact that the tower contained a museum and library. But was there a flaw in the experimental procedure? Hoover Tower had been selected from 60 possible locations which were kept locked away. Not knowing these locations, Russell Targ could not give Price any inadvertent cues. A mini-computer had been used to generate a random number indicating the envelope to be chosen. In another experiment, the target chosen was a local marshland nature reserve. I get this image of crosshairs, looking at crosshairs. Uh, well, getting closer, it's uh, more like an intersection. I get the feeling of a botanical area with crosswalks, very geometrically laid down. A direct hit. But notice the catwalks can only be seen as crosshairs from the air. Another target site, swimming pools. I get the impression of a water treatment plant. It looks like uh, water storage tanks. It's a service road down here. Price sometimes drew what he saw. Chain link fence. Around. We were surprised at the accuracy that Price was able to generate in his transcripts. In one of the cases where the target was a swimming pool complex, he actually described the dimensions of the pools to within 10% of their physical size. When he looked at the various sites he was able to describe for us, it was as though he came zooming in from thousands of feet in altitude, scanned the Bay Area until he found the people at the target site, and then described what they were looking at. It was not as though he was reading their mind, because frequently he would describe items at the site that the outbound experimenters hadn't even seen. For the fourth experiment, the laboratory director took matters into his own hands. 
Wondering if there might be some hidden flaw in the procedure, or indeed outright fraud, he drove out of SRI with Putoff, deliberately having no idea of his final destination. He decided to head west, but after five minutes, suddenly changed his mind and went in the opposite direction. And then continued changing direction. He finally arrived about five miles up the coast at an out-of-the-way marina. What I was seeing is a boat dock or a jetty. Uh, it's about in that direction from here. Uh, yes. A lot of little boats, motor launches, sailboats. Some of the sails are furled. Uh, well, boat dock or jetty. It's funny. Uh, something flashed in. A uh, Chinese or Japanese pagoda-like effect. Does that pagoda effect have anything to do with the boat dock that you saw initially? Is that near where they're standing? Uh, it's behind them. Uh, it's, uh, it's like a restaurant. Highly manicured, lawn. Where the hell would that be? The building was indeed a restaurant. That summer, Price did nine remote viewings in all. Targ and Putoff then had all the data independently assessed. A scientist unconnected with the project went to each of the nine target sites armed with transcripts of all the experiments. He was asked to read each transcript and then judge which of the nine sites most closely corresponded to the descriptions Price had given. The results confirmed how accurate Price had been. Out of the nine sites he had remotely viewed, seven of his descriptions were clear enough for the judge to correctly match them to the actual site. Inevitably, results like that have drawn the critics' fire. Dr. David Marks is a leading critic of remote viewing. He is a psychologist in New Zealand and has conducted remote viewing experiments himself, but without success. Well, I used to think that the target put off experiments might have been uh, a genuine phenomenon. But uh, after looking at their data and doing my own experiments, I've concluded that it's one big illusion. An illusion because of flaws in the judging procedure. After scrutinizing the transcripts, Mark said the results had another explanation. I discovered that there were all kinds of cues littered throughout the transcripts. For example, dates, times, references to previous experiments that had been conducted earlier that day or the day before and so forth. And um, it also uh, turned out that the list of places for the price series had been given to the judge in exactly the correct order so that it was possible to combine this information to put the, the transcripts in correct order and naturally produce a perfect matching with the, the target list. Marx gave the cues to judges in New Zealand along with the list of the sites in order. He says that with the cues alone, his judges matched up the viewings as accurately as the judge in California. But did the original judge really use the cues to make his assessment? When you look at the degree of psychic functioning in the SRI remote viewing material, the cues are trivial. When the 
psychic is saying, I see a lot of little boats in front of me at a dock, and you're standing at the target where there are a lot of little boats in front of a dock, you don't need to look for tiny little cues that say this must have happened in an afternoon and must have been at least the fourth one in this series. You know what it's about. The psychic functioning is overwhelming. But Marx's criticisms did challenge the judge's results. So psychologist Charles Tart went through the transcripts, renumbering them and removing the cues. He sent out a second independent judge. Once again, the judge confirmed seven of the nine descriptions. Marx, however, is unconvinced. He thinks Tart had an unconscious bias. The other factor, of course, is that one of Targ and Putoff's collaborators, Charles Tart, actually did the editing. And um, we simply can't trust this type of editing since he's obviously biased. The possibility of experimenter bias is taken very seriously in psychology. In a new field like Psy, it is a criticism which will stand until other researchers get results. Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher is a theoretical physicist keenly interested in psychic phenomena. She has done a number of remote viewing studies and reports successful results, sometimes over very long distances. One of her subjects tried to describe where someone was nearly 2,000 miles away in New Orleans. I'm getting a sense of circular patterns and rings and discs as if looking down on them from the top. It looks like a large saucer just sitting in the middle of a city. The person was here at the Superdome. Remote viewing has even been tried across the Atlantic. Dr. Marilyn Schlitz is a parapsychologist at the Mind Science Foundation. In 1979, she published a successful replication of remote viewing with 24 students as viewers. Then she decided to try herself. At noon every day for 10 days, Schlitz attempted to find a colleague of hers in Rome, a city she had never visited. First time I personally tried to do it, the kinds of impressions I got were very similar to what I'd had like in a daydream. They were very faint and it required effort to bring those faint impressions into a form that could be recognized and could be articulated. Her viewings were independently judged and found to be highly accurate. Rome Airport being one of many striking hits. So has remote viewing been proved? If a number of people in different laboratories can get these results, then you have to start really giving it some credibility. Um, we've done a, a review. Uh, two colleagues and myself have done a review of the remote viewing work and have found that out of 28 formal remote viewing studies that have been published, um, over half have been reported as statistically significant. And these are in various laboratories across the United States. In Los Angeles, one company thinks remote viewing can be exploited commercially. Good afternoon, Mobius. Mobius was founded six years ago by Stephen Schwartz, a 40-year-old ex-Navy consultant. From small beginnings, it now has 10 psychics on the payroll. Well, Mobius was set up to not only explore what psychic functioning is, but also what we can do with it. I think we've reached a point now in the last 100 years of research that we can say a reasonable man is willing to accept the idea that psychic functioning is a reality. And the question then becomes, well, what can we do with it? This girl has been murdered. Stabbed. It's very bloody. And I see this strange kind of narrow room where the murder was committed. It's almost maybe like a mobile home. I think the man who did it uh, is dark. For $5,000, Mobius says it will help you solve a murder case. The use of psychics by the police has a long and controversial history. Some report successes, others abysmal failures, and two controlled studies found psychics were useless. But Schwartz has a new system. Tattoos on his arm. I see a tattoo on his arm. The man is olive-complected, dark brown hair, brown eyes. He has a mustache. He's very clear in my mind's eye right now. 
In the same way that a journalist would talk to a lot of eyewitnesses, we have several psychics each picking up the same information and then average out their reports and come to some general consensus of what did in fact happen. I see him driving. We need to stop thinking of this as something that is occult or weird. We need to begin to think of this as a kind of remote sensing technique that has a signal to noise problem. In Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, the police had two unsolved cases. As a last resort, Michael Rank, district attorney at the time, enlisted the help of Mobius. The case we saw earlier is still sub judice, but Rank was prepared to talk about the other, the case of a missing girl. I sent uh, Mr. Schwartz a photograph of the missing girl and told him that we had a 14-year-old girl who was missing and we'd like to know her whereabouts and her condition. Two psychics were given this photograph and nothing else. Both of the respondents indicated that we had a dead person rather than just a missing person who was alive some unknown location. Unfortunately, this proved to be the case. Rank said the psychics were also accurate about where they'd find the body. It's impressed me enough to try it when we don't have anything else going. Um, I think that naturally you, you couldn't use this as an investigative technique in every case. But if you've run down all your leads and you've got no place else to go, I think that it can give you some fresh approaches and it can stimulate the thought processes of the investigators. Mobius has also ventured into archaeology. In 1979, Stephen Schwartz organized a team of psychics to explore for remains of ancient Alexandria. Where the psychics' impressions coincided, archaeologists searched for finds. Underwater, they discovered extensive ruins. Mobius psychics also located a Byzantine city, telling archaeologists where to dig for this building and describing many of the objects they would find. The psychic is a kind of remote sensing device, which will provide us with a signal that has useful information in it. This is not a cure-all. It is not a magic bullet. It is not weird. It is a new tool that needs to be studied and that I think has a contribution to make to both science and humanity. The U.S. is not the only nation where psychic powers are being explored as potentially useful tools. Russian scientists have studied several subjects who claim to have extraordinary psychokinetic abilities. Nina Kolagina could reportedly move small objects without touching them. Another subject, Karl Nikolaev, took part in allegedly controlled experiments to determine the source of his powers. He claimed to be able to light a lamp at a distance of two meters. Soviet experimenter Dr. Sergeyev of Leningrad concluded that psychokinesis was a kind of electromagnetic radiation. These experiments were performed in the 1960s. Little of what the Russians are studying today is known in the West. But studies by the United States Defense Intelligence Agency conclude that the Soviets may be exploring the use of psychic powers to control people's behavior. Could parapsychology have military applications? Professor Charles Tart has studied the possibility. I would like to think, as some people believe, that psychic powers somehow come from some high spiritual level and can only be used for good. But I don't know anything else in this world that can only be used for good. So I'm afraid there are military uses for psychic. For over a decade, the U.S. government has also been funding psychic research at SRI, where Targ and Putoff did their experiments. From the few unclassified accounts, it's clear they've been working on an extraordinary version of remote viewing. They called it Project Scanate, and it involved a number of psychics, among them Pat Price, the policeman. 
Ingo Swan, a New York artist, and Hella Hammett, a photographer. Scanate stands for scanning by coordinate. The principle was to use the lines of latitude and longitude to remotely view anywhere on the globe. Only a few examples have ever been published. In one experiment, psychic Ingo Swan was asked, what do you see at 49 degrees 20 minutes south, 70 degrees 14 minutes east? Those were the coordinates of a small island in the Indian Ocean, the French island of Kerguelen. Swan immediately made this drawing, describing in topographical detail an island with bays, swamplands, and a large mountain to the west. Hella Hamid, who also took part in Project Scan 8, answers one obvious objection. People will say, oh, well, she knows her geography very well, and you know, that obviously must be in the Indian Ocean, and so on. Uh, we've done a lot of it of translating the coordinates into binary numbers, which I have absolutely no idea what binary numbers are, other than it's a series of ones and zeros. And that worked very well. Matter of fact, it seemed to work better because I didn't sort of rummage around my head, ah, it's uh, so and so far south and so and so far east, and, you know, it could be in the Sahara, it must be dry and so on, which is just clutters up this channel, which uh, gives me the correct signal, rather than thinking about it, because thinking is the worst thing you can do. Absolutely the worst. In theory, they can view anywhere on the planet. One experimental target was a small Russian town near Gorky called Kamenka. It's a center for the lumber industry, so there are logs everywhere. Psychic Keith Harari produced this drawing. It accurately showed a hill and buildings surrounded by poles. But why use remote viewing if you have satellites? After all, spy satellites can now photograph objects only a few feet long. Ella Hammond's answer is that in some things, psychics can do much better. Can you see things like buildings? Oh, of course. Can you look inside buildings? I suppose. Can you look inside buildings? Um... I think I have in the past, yes. As it were, through the roof? I don't know, through what? Maybe through the cellar. <laughs> and you can see what's going on inside? Um, we have done experiments like that, yes. How, how, how detailed can you get? But I can't read. Pat Price could read. I, could, I can't. You I'm you quite can't... illiterate, psychically. <laughs> you mean you can't read uh, words or documents? No. Pat Price could read documents. I believe so. Of course, it's impossible to show absolutely that Pat Price or any of them could do what's been claimed. Complete information on Scanate has never been released. I'm sure that military research in Western countries on psychic stuff is inevitable for balance. My only hope is that somehow our culture will come to its senses and support open, unclassified research on parapsychology with investigators who have a humanistic, uh, positive orientation toward human nature so we can balance the inevitable negative uses that are going to be developed. Of all psi faculties, precognition, or foreseeing the future, is the greatest challenge to our concepts of space and time. This is the remote... In 1975, at SRI, Targ and Putoff began experiments to see if remote viewing could look into the future. Hella Hamid was the first to try. This is a brief reconstruction of an experiment. Where, she was asked, would Putoff be in half an hour's time? It's, it's very dark, and at the end, you come out through an archway, sort of a into a very bright area where there's lots of vegetation. Um, it's like a rose garden. It's very formal. It's, it's a very manicured kind of garden. Throughout her description, Putoff had been away from the lab driving around aimlessly. At a prearranged time after her description had finished, 
a random number generator decided where he was to go. There were nine envelopes, each containing a different location. Any one of them could have been chosen. The random number generator said six, and six said, go to Stanford Hospital Plaza. Half an hour before, Hella Hammond had described seeing a formal manicured garden. And apparently, here it was. The next day, another experiment. Got a quick flash of a black pointed area, um, like, a, like a head of an arrow. Um, he walks into it. It's like a triangle that he walks into. Half an hour later, the randomly selected envelope said, go to the swing in Alma Park. This time, she not only saw into the future, but heard it, too. It's a, a rhythmic kind of squeak, like, like a rusty pump uh, on not well-oiled piston. Just a very rhythmic squeaking. We have very good experience that people can accurately describe events that are hours or days in the future. What one must say is that the viewer in the laboratory is describing some future event that they will experience. That would be the customary way to describe this. We think a more accurate description would be that some future event which will take place causes the viewer at an earlier time to have an experience. A fantastic claim, perhaps. But in 1982, Targ decided to put his confidence in precognition to the test. With a businessman and a psychic as partners, he founded Delphi, a company which took Psy into the marketplace. From October through December of 82, Delphi psychic Keith Harari made nine predictions of future silver prices. He predicted on a Thursday whether on the following Monday prices would be up or down, and whether the change would be more or less than 25 cents. All nine predictions proved accurate. But was Delphi merely following a trend in the market? John Rendy, Delphi's broker, says no. The market in... Uh between September and December, it's been generally an uptrend. Silver prices have been going up. But uh, some of the more spectacular and successful trades were actually on the short side. That is, they sold before they bought back. Uh, uh, so in other words, they, they were uh, making money in anticipation, or they were making a prediction in anticipation of the market coming down, so going against the trend. The broker traded on seven of the nine predictions, netting over $100,000 for Delphi and more for the company's clients. We asked an experienced commodities trader to comment. Well, again, being right in anything in life nine times out of nine is unheard of, absolutely unheard of. And in this business, it's incredible is a weak word. I'm trying to think of a better word. It's, uh, uh, I would say, impossible. I'd like to see it done. After their initial success, Delphi's next attempt to use the system failed. Delphi thinks they have figured out the problem. Meanwhile, they are exploring different applications for ESP. The episode fits a familiar pattern. Claims of spectacular psychic success, which has not been repeated. Believers point to Delphi's profits and say the odds were over 200,000 to one. Skeptics say to be convincing, it must work more than once. Unless psychic powers become more controllable, the skeptics will persist. But meanwhile, people in science, business, and the military are seriously exploring the paranormal. We've been working for so long trying to figure out how it works. We know it works, you know, with all the controlled experiments, but we don't really have very much idea how. What it says is that modern physics is incomplete in many ways and is presently inadequate to describe the data that we've accumulated over this past 10 years' research. If physics isn't complete, 
And physicists are quite used to drastic changes. They have changed their worldview in the past very often. I don't think we know that much about the universe. And in fact, the exciting thing about Psi is that while it appears to violate some of our known physical laws, understanding Psi and beginning to fit it in with the other things that we know will mean we'll have a greatly expanded and more effective understanding of the ordinary physical universe. That's the challenge. That's what's really exciting. For a transcript of this program, send $4 to Nova, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Please.